Many of you may have noticed the woman that just walked across the stage as I came on. I'd like those of you who noticed what the color of her shirt was to please raise your hand. Now, for those of you who noticed that she walked from the right side of the stage to the left, or that she was, in fact, walking in front of you, please raise your hands. It is worth noting that most of you who noticed what the color of her shirt was were women, while for those of you who noticed that object A moved from, po sorry, object woman moved from point A to point B were men. Now, I'm not saying that no woman noticed she was walking here, not at all, nor am I saying that only women pay attention to what other people were wearing. What I'm saying is this, due to the makeup of cells in one's eyes, male and female brains assign different levels of importance to details, such as color, texture, and movement, based on their gender. Because women have more P cells in the retinas of their eyes, which are associated with color and texture, they retain the image of what someone was wearing more easily than where that person was going. On the other hand, males have more M cells in their eyes. These are associated with location, speed, and direction. Where is it? Where is it going? And how fast is it moving? That is why men might be more prone to seeing where the woman was going or be conscious of the fact that she was moving. So, by now you're probably wondering where I'm going with this and why I'm interested in this. Last winter for a TOK assignment, I read an eye-opening book called Why Gender Matters. It was written by Dr. Leonard Sachs, who had graduated from MIT with a PhD in psychology and a master's in biology. He combines them in his daily work as a family physician and has written four books, of, why, of which Why Gender Matters was the first. The New York Times praised this book as a lucid guide to differences between male and female brains. This book inspired me to even pursue a similar path in college next year. Needless to say, it impacted the way in which I think about our character and gender and their relationship with the brain and whether there is one. Leonard Sachs's theory was that the anatomical differences in the brains of young boys and girls correlates with the differences in the way that they act. This is remarkable because not only is this such a controversial topic, nature versus nurture, but it is also an age-old question. Do stereotypes exist because we perpetually force them upon our children and teach them to grow up to be a certain way? Or do they exist because these qualities on which stereotypes are based are actually innate? My goal for you is to think for yourselves where stereotypes come from. Could Leonard Sachs be right about how different the brains in boys and girls are? Or do you think that brains in the in girls and boys are not at all that different, and that they are, however, different because they are taught to be. In addition to that, because of our un unique environment here, I want you to think about how much influence culture has on stereotypes and the manner in which children grow up. Going back to M and P cells and linking it to stereotypes, there has been another study, similar to the one that Leonard Sex conducts, done by the Cambridge Neuroscience Department, which obtained similar results. In this studies, little babies, before they have any idea of what gender is or what is expected of them, are given a basket of toys and cho told to choose one. An overwhelmingly clear amount of boys chose the toy cars, moving the wheels around, throwing them and racing these cars, while the girls chose the dolls with the frilly dresses. This documentary also explains the girls' behaviors by saying it is a result of thousands of years of evolution, their innate motherhood. To back this up, a similar study was done, but this time with monkeys. The male monkeys were automatically more attracted to the cars that were lying in the grass in front of them, while the female ones immediately picked up the dolls. This might suggest that girls are more, sorry, that girls are more attracted to dolls simply because they see the texture and the color of their clothing more, more clearly in combination with their innate sense of motherhood. Because of the differences between the amount of M and P cells that we have in our heads, we see different things, and Sachs suggests that this is then reflected within our character. Girls pay much more attention to detail simply because they see it better. This conflicts with the idea that society teaches all girls that they must play with dolls because trucks aren't girly enough. Bringing it back to cultural influence, we must ask whether some cultures perpetuate these stereotypes more than others do. It is said that Latin America has a strong machista culture. This could impact the roles that girls and boys feel like they need to fill. To be clear, I'm not arguing that society does not impact children or the way they behave at all. Of course, behavior is a culmination of both nature and nurture. 
I believe, however, that Sachs is sta stating that biology plays a much more significant role than is commonly perceived, influencing psychology more than we thought. However, perhaps, feel he perhaps boys here feel more compelled to play with trucks than they might elsewhere, say in Sweden, where they're trying to eradicate gender differences completely. According to a New York Times article, Boys Won't Be Boys, the Swedish are taking the pronouns he and she out of their vocabulary and replacing it with a neutral substitute, hen. Maybe the culture there their, influences their children in a vastly different way than it does here. What I mean by this is that perhaps that what they are taught to be a boy in Sweden is vastly different than what, it, what boys are taught that it means to be a boy here in Latin America. The gender roles in Sweden seem to be much more homogenous than they do here. Perhaps in a Latin American country, a boy might be more afraid to ask for a doll after he is done playing with his truck, more so than a boy in Sweden might. This does not take away from the fact, however, that he will be naturally inclined to play with the truck in the first place. In Latin America, there are still traces of machismo culture that was more pertinent many years ago. Does this have any effect on the way children behave and develop? What connections might you draw to machismo and how children are raised? This is the definition of machismo that a popular dictionary gives. Although this is a generalization, is there anyone who agrees with it? Not perhaps if you agree to some extent. Do we see, still see traces of this today? An article from The Guardian outlines the traces of machismo culture in Latin America, in Mexico particularly, quite well. The author, Nina Lacani, outlines how she, as a woman in Latin America, experiences sexism as a result of the machismo culture that once presided in the region. She says, living in Mexico means enduring deep-rooted machismo attitudes and has even affected the way that I dress. So, she acknowledges the fact that machismo still presides over people's composure and the way that they act. This perhaps highlight how culture influences one's actions and ways of thinking and eventually their ways of growing up. Growing up in Latin America might result in the machista sentiment being perpetuated further and further and may affect how boys and girls perceive their own gender roles. Another investigation was done by a statistician and scientist at the International Forestry Research, Sunderland and Achi Dawan, regarding different perceptions of gender roles. It illustrates who, in different regions of the world, brings the most income into the home in terms of unprocessed foods, so crops. In this image, it is clear that in Latin America, the men bring these resources into the home, while in Africa, underneath, it is typically the women. This might shed some light on how machista culture in Latin America might influence the men to do more ma manual labor, while women do more nurture-related work. What this research is supposed to highlight is that we should not forget that culture plays a role in the development of our children, how they grow up, the person they become, and even the job that they choose, perhaps just as much as our anatomical differences do. There are many reasons why we should consider anatomical differences in the brains of boys and girls and then adjust the way we teach young children to grow up accordingly. However, it is much more important for us to realize simply that biology has a significant impact on our society in combination with our culture, our predecessors, and our stereotypes. We are shaped not only by our genetic makeup, but also by our friends, our parents, our history, and our community. So, even though I can tell you about countless more differences in the brain, such as the way boys and girls hear, or the way they relate feelings to language, or how MNP cells means that the person you are sitting next to and you may have seen a different presentation just now, I'd rather you ask yourself how we affect children's perceptions of themselves, to become conscious of the unconscious limitations that we may be placing on our children as a result of our biases and cultural norms. Are the various influences on the way we treat kids conscious or subconscious? And based on that, can or should we do anything to change them? Thank you. <laughs>